Welcome. I am Rachel Naftal coming to you live with the Caroline Marshall Drawn Center for the Arts and Humanities in the College of Liberal Arts at Auburn University. Today, I am honored to be joined online by two distinguished guests, the Honorable Ila Gandhi coming to us from South Africa and Anu Radha Shankar joining us from India. I thank them both for being with us today. We are in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, and these are uncertain times. One way we draw strength as humans is to look back at other troubling times and tell stories of human resilience. Ila and Anu Radha are here today to share the story of Kasturba Gandhi. The Honorable Ila Gandhi, granddaughter of Mahatma and Kasturba Gandhi, is the founder and chairperson of the Gandhi Development Trust, which promotes nonviolence. Gandhi was a member of parliament in South Africa from 1994 to 2004. In 2002, she received the Community of Christ International Peace Award, and in 2007, in recognition of her work to promote Mahatma Gandhi's legacy in South Africa, she was awarded the prestigious Padma Bhushan Award by the Indian government. Welcome, Ila Gandhi. Thank you for being with us today. I will now turn the floor over to you as we hear the story of your grandmother, Kasturba Gandhi. Thank you, uh, Rachel. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening or this morning uh, as it is in uh, the States now. Um, firstly, I just want to make three points uh, about the period in which my grandmother lived. The first point is that it was 1869 when she was born. During that time, the position of women was uh, very different to the kind of position that we have today. In those days, women were considered, had a very specific role and they, uh, it was considered unnecessary to send a woman or a girl child to school. So the first point is that because of that um, understanding during that period, everyone accepted that girls don't go to school. And so Kasturba didn't go to school and she herself accepted that there's no need for her to go to school. She was taught during that time, her role as a mother, as um, a wife, as a person who looks after the family and looks after the home. So all the household chores were taught to her, how to take care of people was taught to her. And she learned that from her mother in her home at a very young age. The third point I want to make is that the girls in uh, those days, in fact, all, all the people got married at a very young age. So Kasturba was actually only about nine years old when she was betrothed to Gandhiji. Gandhiji's father was the prime minister of Purbandar and Kasturba's uh, father was the mayor of that city. So, um, you know, they, uh, the two families were friends and uh, Kasturba and uh, Gandhiji knew each other from early childhood. And so at age 13, they were married. And she came to live in Gandhiji's house. But Gandhiji was not satisfied with the fact that she was not able to read and write. So he would persuade her to read and write, and he would want her to learn. 
and she was quite reluctant to learn. So that was the first moment of, uh, you know, resistance to this uh, husband of hers who wanted her to be literate and she didn't, she didn't see the need for her to be literate. Later on that changed, of course, and she began to read and write and she began to uh, promote uh, literacy in women. So that was the change in her life. Now, the other point that is of importance is that during that period, you know, uh, young girls were taught that you have to go to the temple and observe all kinds of rituals, religious rituals. They were quite elaborate. They still are. And so every, um, you know, day of... Uh, a special worship, women would gather together, they would make uh, sweetmeats and they would uh, do all kinds of things like paintings on the, um, you know, on the floor and things like that. There, there were lots of rituals that uh, young ladies would enjoy doing together. And so Kastuba enjoyed doing this and she would go out with her you know, the sister-in-law and um, others in the family to observe these kinds of rituals. And that used to make Gandhiji very angry because he felt that she should be at his beck and call. He was the Lord and master of the house. And so that's how, you know, he was brought up to think and that is what he wanted of his wife, but she wasn't prepared to accede. And uh, she would listen to him, but she would do exactly as she wanted to do. So that is why Gandhiji said that he learned nonviolent resistance from Kasturba. She was the first nonviolent resistor in his life. And he learned that from her. She was also a very intelligent person, very uh, resourceful. Uh, she would learn things very quickly. And so um, her life was quite a challenging life. You know, she was only uh, 16 when she had her first child. And within four days, it was a premature baby. And within four days, the child passed on. She had to accept that. Then she was 19 years old when she had her first child. And the child was only about three to four months old when Gandhiji decided that um, with the advice of some of the family members, that he should go to London and qualify as a lawyer. And uh, she uh, accepted this and even went to the extent of, uh, you know, giving her jewelry to be pawned in order to raise funds for him to make the trip to London. And uh, he stayed in London for three years during which time she single-handedly brought up her young son. So that was also, again, a learning curve for her to remain at home without her husband and to bring up the child on her own. Of course, she had the support of the extended family with whom she lived. But it was a difficult situation, but Kasturba came through it. Then came the time when Gandhiji was called to South Africa. And uh, this was, uh, you know, because he was asked to represent a person in a court case. And um, initially he came to South Africa on his own, but three years later he 
Rose was still born, and the two children, but I think she had another child as well. And uh, the two children and Kastuba accompanied Gandhiji back to South Africa in um, 1896. And it was in South Africa that the transformation began to take place. And Kasturba really rose to the occasion. Her resilience was just amazing because there were many, many trials in South Africa. The way of life was different. All the rituals and all the things that she was accustomed to in India, those things didn't happen in South Africa. Life in South Africa was totally different. But she adjusted. And, um, you know, the story is long. I can't go through everything about, uh, you know, how she adjusted all the different incidents in her life. But the one of the crucial ways in which she had to adjust was when they moved to Phoenix Settlement. Phoenix Settlement was the first ashram. An ashram is similar to a monastery. Uh, although people are not monks there, people come to live together according to certain rules. And Gandhiji had uh, a few of those rules. And according to that, families came and lived together at Phoenix Settlement. But they very soon, uh, Kasturba took on the reins and became the leader, a quiet leader at Phoenix Settlement. And um, some of the writings, you know, uh, when Kasturba passed away, tributes were paid to her. And uh, one of them said that Gandhiji may think that uh, he is a great leader, but when it comes to the ashram, it's Kasturba who is the person who leads. And so Kasturba was the one who conducted everything, all the affairs of the ashram. She kept uh, accounts meticulously she ensured that all the responsibilities were shared and that everybody was on board in doing everything. She was firm and yet very, very humble and um, democratic in her style. A real wonderful leader according to the people who lived in that ashram. So she learned this skill of leading people and of being able to live in that communal style uh, very quickly and took on the reins. So this is again a challenge that people uh, need to learn to take on. That is resilience. You come across uh, adversity and you have to then begin to think, how am I going to uh, live under these conditions? And soon you will learn to adapt and to be able to, um, you know, take on the reins, take on the challenge. And that is what Kasturba did. Um, you know, Gandhiji had said once uh, when he was sitting in Peter Maritzburg on a cold night when he was thrown out of the train because simply because he was not a white person. And uh, he had a first class ticket, but we threw him out of that compartment. Sitting on that cold um, waiting room in Peter Maritzburg, he looked at three options that he had. The one was that he could, um, you know, just leave, go back to India and uh, live a comfortable life, a life where he won't be 
insulted as he was in South Africa, where his status would be counted and he would be respected. Um, but he said that that is a cowardly way to run away. The second choice he had was to stay and adapt to the conditions. So the word adapt, adapt to those conditions and accept the conditions and live according to them. That was the second choice. And he said, no, to adapt to these kinds of unjust uh, conditions is to succumb and to accept injustice. That is not what he was gonna do. So the third choice was to stay and fight those conditions. And that is what he chose. So Surma exactly did the same thing. She didn't adapt in order to just accept any injustice, but she adapted in a way that she uh, accepted the good points of the ashram, but ensured that all the disciplines and all the values of the ashram were upheld. And that was her strength, her resilience and her strength. The other point is when um, she decided that she was going to participate in the campaign against, uh, you know, the, there was a, a regulation um, that um, Indian marriages or customary marriages will not be recognized. And she was quite upset about that, that how can her marriage to Gandhiji not be recognized? And so she said she was going to protest. And the way they had decided to protest was to defy a law, an unjust law. And this unjust law was a, a law which prevented the Indian people from crossing a border. And um, she said that she was going to cross this border without a permit. And so she, uh, together with other women, defied the law and courted imprisonment. And that was her defiance against both the, the others' marriages. There was a tax that was imposed on the indentured workers and this past system, which imposed this um, uh, restriction on the community. So that was her fearlessness, her courage that came to the fore. In that moment of, uh, you know, her trial, she emerged as a courageous woman who was prepared to go to prison and face the difficulty. And in prison itself, they, uh, you know, being a vegetarian, the uh, prison authorities didn't respect this, um, you know, the vegetarianism that she uh, was accustomed to. And they wanted her to just uh, eat what she was given. And she resisted that. And she said, no, I'm a vegetarian and you have to provide me with a vegetarian diet. And when the prison authorities didn't accede, she went on a fast. And that was the first time that uh, even Gandhiji saw that, uh, you know, you can use a fast as a method to um, resist um, evil. And he said, in his autobiography that he learned this from Kasturma because that is what she started doing. Later on, when they moved to India, she again, you know, began to go uh, with Gandhiji and uh, work in the community to preach, you know, the, when uh, he started the 
uh, spinning, you know, uh, and spinning, she began to preach the value of uh, spinning cotton. She gave away a very good sari uh, that uh, was given to her as a gift by a friend, but it wasn't hand spun, so she uh, they burnt the clothes and she burnt that sari of hers and she began to wear only hand spun clothes. So again, that was her strength and she did this uh, being convinced that this is the correct thing to do. She was also brought up to respect the caste system because that is how they felt that this is a system that you respect and you live with. But later on, when she realized that this is a very unjust system, she began to respect uh, Gandhiji's ideas and brought in people who were of a lower caste to live in the ashram where they lived in Sabarmati. And they were, you know, outcasted by many people. They were, uh, you know, uh, donations were stopped to the ashram by some of the richer Hindu people. But she remained firm in her resolve. So again, that firmness, that courage, that understanding is revealed in all these experiences. And eventually, after many times that she went to prison because of her defiance of the unjust laws, on the last occasion when in 1942, uh, you know, they called for a quit India resolution. <clears throat> And uh, they had organized mass meetings. So there was a huge meeting at the Shivaji Park in Mumbai. But on the night after the 8th of August, on that night, the police came and arrested all the leaders. And Sri was also arrested. He was supposed to address that meeting on the 9th of August. And when the people said, well, Gandhiji is not here, what are we going to do? Kasturba said, I will come and address the people. And she was going to go there and say to the people that we have to fight this battle. We have to be united and we have to be strong. And, um, you know, it was the resolution that they had taken was do or die. And so everybody was supposed to uh, organize and begin to defy these unjust laws. And she um, persuaded, you know, was going to persuade the community to, to pool all their resources and get together and fight this battle. But then on that day, she was arrested and put into prison. At first, she was in an ordinary prison, but because uh, health was uh, quite frail, she was moved to uh, the prison where Gandhiji was in Pune. And uh, she stayed there, um, even though her health was, you know, sort of up and down. She had a couple of uh, massive um, heart attacks whilst in prison, but she recovered from that. But then eventually on the 11th of uh, February, 1944, that's two years after being in that prison, she passed on. And there, uh, you know, she was buried or uh, cremated in the prison yard. And that's where her grave still stands. So Kasturba, you know, revealed that um, firstly, you know, you can uh, begin to change your own 
you know, idea of lifestyle in order to uh, face up to the challenges that confront you. And that is what is happening to us today. We are confronted with this huge challenge of the coronavirus and of the shutdown. We need to learn about the virus. We need to know exactly why and what is required of us and begin to commit ourselves to getting rid of this virus and to adapt to a new way of life. A lot of things we have learned during this time of shutdown. We have seen how the environment is suddenly beginning to flourish because there's so little traffic, because there's so little carbon. And uh, all those things should teach us a lesson that life cannot be as it was after this shutdown is over, after we have conquered the coronavirus. We have learned lessons during this time and we have to look at how our life is going to change after the coronavirus. That is taking, um, you know, the challenge, that is being resilient, that is showing courage, as Kastupa did. Thank you very much. I hope um, I have given uh, an overview. I think my friend uh, Anuji will give you further um, talk about Kastupa. Thank you. Thank you, Ila. You gave a great overview of Kasturba, and I think it's truly inspiring for all of us during this time to hear her story. At this time, I would like to introduce to all of you who are joining us um, our next speaker, who is Anu Radha Shankar. She is a senior police officer from India. She was awarded the Gallantry Medal by the President of India in 2009 for busting a weapons factory run by extremists. She is known for her engagement with civil society for effective policing. She speaks on the role of Mahatma Gandhi and Kasturba in the Indian independence and social reform movement at various fora in India and abroad. Thank you for joining us, Anu Radha and I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Rachel. For me, it's such an honor to be here with Ila Gandhi, and uh, she has enlightened all of us about someone who's not only her grandmother, but also, in a way, the mother of the nation. Someone who was the first freedom fighter in uh, the independence movement of India. As uh, you have uh, uh, said in my introduction, that it was not only the Indian independence movement, but it was the Indian independence and social reform movement. And what Ilaji has just told us was about how Kasturba was a vehicle of social reform. She began with a, a, a background of conservative Indian household woman and how she became a leader in her own right. She almost always led the freedom struggle after Mahatma Gandhi had jumped into it in India. I'm not talking of South Africa because Elaji has spoken of South Africa and uh, I would rather focus on the Indian independence movement. And she took over the reins every time that Mahatma Gandhi would not be available. And uh, whether he was arrested or he was unwell, and not only of the movement for independence, but also for social reform. As Elaji has pointed out, that later on in her life, she took over, uh, also, uh, she actually understood the vicious uh, stranglehold of caste on the Indian society. And she worked in places like South India, very deep into the South, uh, South Indian uh, rural landscape uh, on the issue of untouchability. And she walked, she traveled, and she talked. 
because Mahatma Gandhi was not keeping very well. I don't want to uh, talk too much today because um, I would like uh, to just comment on what Elaji said and point out a couple of things. Elaji has told you about how the transformation of this uh, young girl from a well-to-do family to someone who actually took over a, a, an ascetic life came about. And this was not only because she was a, a, an obedient wife, because as Mahatma Gandhi says, that she had a very strong will, which I mistook earlier for obstinacy. But I realized that she would not do anything unless she was convinced. And this convi conviction came to Kasturba by and by. She would reason out, she would argue, sometimes even quarrel with her husband, and then come to the point where she would agree to a thing. She might not agree to everything. She never agreed to take off her red bangles because she was very fond of them, even though he sometimes told her that why are you wearing such colorful bangles? But she, she agreed to things which she thought was reasonable and which she thought was important in the change that they were together bringing about in the world through the Indian independence movement. So this is something which, which is a takeaway from her life, which, which we can uh, uh, garner from what Elaji has told us. There's another thing I want to tell you about, and which is very uh, pertinent in these times. One of the biggest pandemics of the world was the 1918 Spanish flu. It did not spare any place in the world, but it was one of the worst in India. And of course, there was a lot of, uh, there, has, there have been many studies about it. But Mahatma Gandhi, his ashram, his, uh, he had another ashram here. He, one of his uh, major ashrams in, was in Gujarat, in uh, Ahmedab, near Ahmedabad. In his ashram, not only many inmates, but Mahatma Gandhi himself fell very ill with the flu. And he writes that he felt that death was coming near. In fact, one of the sub, sub captions in his experiments of, with truth is that death did not come and he he had severe dysentery low grade fever and the flu was really breaking him he was really in a very dire position the doctor and one of his very close doctors uh, caretakers uh, shankar lalji he told him to take some milk and as you know mahatma gandhi had vowed not to take any milk or any any animal product actually so it was very difficult to convince him to have milk because he was very, very weak. But Kasturba said, the doctor asked, what is your problem with cow's milk and, and buffalo's milk? So Mahatma Gandhi said that there, are, there was a very bad uh, process of extracting more milk from the cows, uh, which was called the pook. And he said, I, I, I do not agree with that. And uh, it, in any case, I do not want to take milk from the cow. It is not for me, it is for the calf. So the doctor said, that what can we do now? So Kasturba very quietly said, what about goat's milk? And in this way, and, and so Mahatma Ji could not say anything because there was no such process involved in taking goat's milk and the doctor immediately jumped on it and he said, yes, goat's milk is very good. And he started taking goat's milk. He says that he kept feeling guilty about taking goat's milk also, but it was that was Kasturba's very fine way of making her stubborn husband adjust to things which he wouldn't otherwise. So she was one of those people who in a very gentle manner also conducted things in Mahatma Gandhi's life where he was not convinced by anyone else, he was convinced by her. And, and that was one important contribution that she made in creating the pers persona of the man who, who gave the world a solution for most of its problems. Like whether it is climate change, or whether it is disparity amongst peoples, whether it is personal spiritual progress, he gave solutions for our times. And she was the architect of this man. So uh, that was, I personally feel that is my Kasturba. She is the creator. She's not only the partner of Mahatma Gandhi, but she is the creator of the spiritual leader whom the world has to look up to now in these very difficult times where we are, we feel that we have been left to fend for ourselves. But actually, there are these people who are like sentinels guarding us, 
showing us the way how they dealt with these things. And during this pandemic uh, in 1918, the Spanish flu, Mahatma Gandhi, while on his sick bed, gave a leadership to the entire Indian independence movement and converted it into a service movement. You, if you read about it at that time, you will notice that the British government had left the people, the British Raj actually, had left the people to their own you know, devices because the war had depleted their resources probably or they didn't bother about natives dying. I do not know what the reason was, but whatever it was, the Indian independence movement, Mahatma Gandhi's pe people went to the most remote rural corners of India and took care of people. This actually united the whole country, which was broken into castes, communities, language groups, and they saw that there is this movement led by this man who has come back from South Africa just about four years back. And he's just taken, his people have just taken over the care of the ordinary rural people of India. And this was a turning point, as you can see. And you can see that just before 1918, you do not find so many women or children, you know, coming out on the streets. But just after 1918, you see lots of people more being mobilized for the freedom struggle. That was because they noticed that this organization has actually served us. This organization led by Mahatma Gandhi, fed by Kasturba Gandhi. So this, we also have, this time, we have, you know, to look at people who are walking the path of Gandhi, who are carrying the legacy of Gandhi, like Elaji, and they are the people who are going to show us the way out from this crisis today. This is a crisis which the humanity has faced multiple times. And very recently, just 100 years back, what is 100 years in human history? Just 100 years back, Mahatma Gandhi and his uh, whole team, Kasturbaji, and the whole of their movement, they showed us how to work our way out of that, how to connect people in that, how to look after each other, even when we feel that we are all alone and that there is nobody there to look after us. This is what I want to comment about. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you, Elaji, for your absolutely wonderful presentation. Thank you. It's, it is clear that Casturbo is truly a wise and resilient woman. And I think it's inspirational for all of us to hear her story today while we are going through this time. Thank you both Anu Radha and again, Ila for sharing the story. And as you know, we've been live on Facebook this entire time. So we've had a few questions come in for both of you. Um, the first question is, how do the principles that Kasturba and Mahatma Gandhi were known for translate to today's time? Okay, shall I go for that? Absolutely. Thank you. <clears throat> so I think that today, more than ever before, we need those principles. Uh, two things that, um, you know, Kasturba and Mahatma Gandhi taught us. <clears throat> One is the whole question of nonviolence. That whatever we do, it has to be through nonviolent means. And nonviolence is not just the absence of violence, but it is more proactive in the sense that it is um, loving the people that you work with, loving everybody loving nature, loving the environment, loving animals, and loving people. So you don't have enemies, you love people. But sometimes you don't like the things that other people do. So your quarrel is against what other people do and not against the people themselves. Now, separating the person from the deed is a difficult task, but it's a task that we need to learn. This is what Gandhiji taught us. Uh, and it, it's something that is not just going to come overnight. We have to practice to learn that. <clears throat> the second point is, 
but it's not just about a struggle. You know, they were struggling against unjust laws, but there are lots of things that we can do ourselves. We can't sit back and say, okay, the government is bad, it's not doing this, it's not doing that, and so on. We have to, and we have the power to do things ourselves. And this is what, as Anaji had said, uh, that Raniji, you know, um, uh, or Kasturba and Raniji, uh, took it upon themselves to go and nurse the sick people. Similarly, in South Africa as well, a plague broke out and both Kasturba and Gandhiji risked their lives and went into the villages and nursed the people. And uh, at the same time, you know, called for the improvement of conditions. So they protested about the poor conditions in those areas and asked for better conditions to be um, you know, provided for the community, but at the same time gave service to the community, nursed them and took care of them. So I think that those are two very important points for us today. We, when we uh, look around us, we see th those who are deprived, we say, we are on, um, you know, shut down. Many of us are sitting in our homes. We have these computers. We are able to communicate. But then there are a equal number of people who don't have a home. So where do they lock up? What do they do? They are on the street. And because it is uh, shut down at the moment, those people are being housed in temporary quarters and so on. And somebody wrote on one of the, um, you know, um, uh, social media that uh, for the first time, the homeless people are given a mattress and a blanket, a pillow and a, a bed sheet to sleep on. What's going to happen after? the town is over, where are they going to go back to? And so this is what we need to think about, that they are those people. What have we been doing about them? And we need to start looking at ways in which this huge divide between the poor and the ultra-rich is narrowed and that everybody has access to basic necessities of life. So those are the lessons that we learn from Gandhiji, because that is what he said, that independence is not just about one government replacing another government. Independence is about providing to the people the basic necessities of life. A really democratic government would look at what are the needs of the people and would sit down with the people and work out a solution. So we work with the people and we find solutions to the problems of the people. I think those are the points that uh, I would say we should carry forward. Thank you. And Anu Gadha, do you have anything you want to add? I think it's perfect. What <laughs> Perfect, actually. That is the manifesto, actually, of modern Gandhian thought. You know, and, and I'm glad that this is being recorded so that, you know, you can transcribe it and put it up on the walls and let people see. And this is exactly what we have to see. Because Gandhiji said that this, this earth has enough for everybody's need, but not enough for one person's greed. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. And between the greed and the need, that's what Elaji is talking about. We have to see whether, where, where we have to rein in the greed for people's, you know, to fulfill other people's need. You know, you need to rein in some people's greed, you know, so, so that everybody's needs are fulfilled.
Yes, and this time is definitely testing all of us on reining in our greed versus our need. So I think the final question I have, um, it's come in various forms online. So I think I'm going to sum it up like this and it might be something you feel like you've already spoken to, but I just want to bring some closure to today is that the pandemic has obviously restructured and shaped our lives tremendously at this time. What final piece of advice do each of you have for those joining us today? Um, what's your final words of wisdom? Yeah. I'm sure the final words of wisdom should come from the really wise one from Elaji, um, but I feel that uh, all of us need to, because we are able to communicate much more, the people who have the means of communication, we need to <clears throat> start this discourse that, right, now when the pandemic is there, everybody has got now this, you know, what do you say, the, the milk of human kindness is flowing, and we are looking at people who are homeless, who are on the streets, who are the have-nots, and we are trying to share a bit of what we have. This needs to change. This needs to be looked at from the perspective of everybody's rights. Everybody's, one person's rights are another person's duties. That's also from Mahatma Gandhi, by the way. And so we need to understand that with our rights, we also have some responsibilities. And that responsibility, each one has to take. If we do not take the responsibility, we cannot ensure anybody's rights. And this has to be talked about, decided by people who are now interconnected much more than before the pandemic. Because now you have nowhere else to go but to connect with each other now, the whole world. So I think that we need to talk, think very clearly about this relationship between rights and responsibilities. If we have had enough talk about rights, rights, rights. We need to talk also about duties, the duty of the state, the duty of the state to look after people who cannot look after themselves because the state has made such a system where some people have a lot and some people have not. So the duty of the state, the duty of the society to ensure equal treatment, equal opportunity to every creature creature, I'm not talking about just human beings, everyone. Why do I need to go into the forest and peer at lions who are living in their own forest? They are not coming to peer into our housing societies, housing colonies, housing uh, our streets. So let there be peace on this earth because the duty of the state, the society, and then the duty of the individual. The duty of the individual to recognize that it's not only their right which is important, is the right of everyone that is important. And if you recognize that, then you're fulfilling your duty when you decide that each one is free, but no one is free to break your nose, right? So these, this, these are the words all culled from the philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi from the life of Kasturba. Because remember one thing, that Mahatma Gandhi and Kasturba were not philosophers who wrote books. Their philosophy was practice. They first practiced and then they talked about it and other people wrote about it, researched about it, commented about it. But their whole philosophy, their whole life was like George Orwell calls it a pilgrimage. He, he used to call Mahatma Gandhi's life a pilgrimage. And a pilgr this, through this pilgrimage, through, through this practice, he has shown us this way. So this is what I want to say that the state must take responsibility. The society must take responsibility. And finally, the individual must take responsibility. That's the only way we can guarantee a better earth. You know, that's the only way they, that we can fight things like this pandemic. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Ila Gandhi, do you have any final words of wisdom or advice that you would like to share with those watching us today? Well, I think uh, Anuji has summed up uh, just about everything I would like to say. Uh, I think that uh, responsibility and duties of the state, 
the community and the individual is very, very important. We need to come to terms with it. We need to understand it and we need to practice it because at the end of the day, it's what we do that counts, not what we say. So I think that um, I'd leave it at that. Okay. Well, I want to thank you both one more time for joining us today. It has been a pleasure and an honor to speak with you and to be able to share this with the Auburn family and anyone else who has joined us online today. Um, I want y'all to stay safe. I want everybody who's watching to please stay safe and reflect on these words of wisdom that we've received today. And please check this page regularly for future programs to come. Thank you. Thank you.